good day class um well uh, as we have been you know uh, discussing over the last you know few sessions i mean uh, today's session actually as a the challenges of marketing financial services uh, as you know i'm Corbimenta and i take the financial services you know class obviously i take other you know marketing you know courses towards the marketing uh, marketing management but we're doing financial services marketing and as we discussed you know uh, in the last session we realized that the financial services you know industry is increasingly growing in this country and i think factors that have actually been contributing to the growth of the industry were discussed in the last session as a result there has to be uh, what do you call in-depth knowledge of the industry hence its importance in institutions like ours and its importance you know for people like you to actually get to know of it so today we're looking at the challenges of marketing financial services so basically we're saying that because of the nature of the financial services it is daunting marketing it unlike other goods and services you know naturally people wouldn't go off their way to securing financial services so when you're actually marketing financial services you have so many impediments so some of it some of these impediments are actually regulatory because the market is very you know difficult in terms of you know the characteristics of consumers you know in terms of protection of consumers so there are quite a lot of issues that have to be understood from regulatory you know perspective from consumer behavior perspective now we'll touch a lot more on the regulatory you know in this particular session and it is because you know when banks or insurance you know are operating now there's a tendency that they could take advantage of people's distressed positions and as a result the regulatory framework has to work tightly in in order to control some of these you know issues you know, and we shall see that again when it comes to for example pricing you realize that the regulatory you know institutions would you know set certain parameters certain framework within which the financial services you know has to operate you know, again, these are all factors that actually goes on to make the, the, the industry a little bit difficult in marketing, unlike the other you know, sectors. So let's have a look at the session overview. It is important to recognize that consumer behavior in financial services is complex, from the business to consumer, customer to business, to business to customer. It is thus imperative that we understand how marketing theory underpins the marketing of financial services to appeal to different categories of customer behavior. Session outline says, the key topics to be covered in this session are as follows. The changing financial services industry, which we discussed extensively in the last session. The changing consumer, the economic forces, regulations and other regulations reading list as usual as you can find them okay so this is the the marketplace of the industry and we're saying the changing marketplace of the financial services industry you have the indus industry consolidation you have fragmenting consumer base you have consumer trust you have new entrants and i take these ones you know, one after the other. Industry consolidation. I mean, there's an understanding that the growth of the industry is actually inching towards few hands. I mean, the provision of financial services. Over the past years, we have seen the massive growth of the industry, and I think this one is much more global, and then we can actually come to the uh, contextual, in the country contesting. Now, there had been the growth of the financial sector, but increasingly, we have seen the consolidation of few powers, you know, 
manipulating or operating in the industry. Few banks controlling most of the credit facilities, you know, few banks controlling most of the insurance in the industry, or few few insurance companies controlling the bulk of the insurance industry. So we're saying that there's an increasing consolidation. And this increasing consolidation is purely, or one of them, uh, because of competition. Because, you know, the industry, there's a lot more consumer demand. Consumers are demanding for higher services, higher quality, and they are demanding for more, more value. Because of that, most of these businesses that actually, you know, raise their head are not able to meet the challenges, and as a result, they are swallowed up but those, the giants that have the resources, the multinationals. As a result, you have quite a number of you know, financial services providers that have actually you know, been acquired or been, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, been matched and all that you know, to the big place. So we're saying that there's an increase in consolidation into few hands of businesses. Now, fragmented consumer base, as we saw, there's an increase in you know, the developmental agenda of countries, you know, trying to make sure that a lot, of, a lot more people will be brought out of poverty. Most of the poverty alleviation processes and, and, and programs that have been affected by countries, by governments, have made it necessary for people, especially small-scale industries, to, to crop up. So people are increasingly owning their own businesses. We have family businesses, sole proprietorship, partnerships of some kinds, we have all these, you know, kind of coming up. So we don't actually have the traditional uh, kind of businesses, multinationals or international business or large scale businesses seeking financial assistance or seeking financial services. But increasingly, we have seen the growth of the middle class owning their own businesses, the growth of the micro type of businesses coming up. And we've seen substantially the growth of the technology sector. You know, a lot of startups have actually come up from the technology sector that actually require capital. So increasingly, there's a fragmented, you know, kind of a consumer base all tapping into the financial industry. So that has actually made the industry grow, as we saw with, you know, in the last session. You know, there's an increase. And then, of course, you have the family, you know, or the domestic or the consumer market. We have increasingly people going for holidays, you know, asking for holiday packages that are actually credit-based, you know, asking for other packages, you know, the use of credit card, the use of international, you know, travel wallet and all those. So there has been an expansion in the demand of financial services. And it hadn't been in the hands of the few maybe top 1% or even in the middle. But increasingly, we have seen even the base, the lower class, also requir requiring financial services. Again, as a result of you know, government policies like financial inclusion, which we saw in the last session, we discussed in the last session. Financial inclusion has, as a policy, had actually you know, brought along so many people out of poverty and pursuing their goals and all these people require some sort of financial services. So we can see, we can see that's why we can see the fragmentation of the consumer base. But increasingly, we have also seen the consumer trust a problem in the industry. In as much as people are ready to assess, you know, to access financial services, they're also ready not to be taken for granted. And the issues that have actually bedeviled the industry over the past years, especially from the crunch period in 2008 onwards, we have seen the gradual decrease in consumer trust, especially in banks. Now, people think that the banks are paying themselves bigger, you know, wages, bigger allowances, bigger bonuses, and as a result, your trust in the financial sector is waning. So consistently, we've seen the alternatives. Other people are crowdsourcing, i.e., you know, seeking money from friends and relations in order to make up capital, you know, or seeking financial services from, you know, unconventional, you know, uh, uh, what do you call sources, like even retail, you know, shops and all that, you know. So that's another kind of uh, things that is actually cropping up 
you know, in the industry globally. Then we have the new entrants, and like I said, even now we have retail shops going into financial services. Retail shops, you know, giving out, you know, credit cards. Retail shops giving out insurance policies and all that. And these are new entrants. You know, their core business is not in financial services. However, they are leveraging on the on the on the resources, the resources of having a large consumer base, you know, having a large followership, you know, as the attraction point to offer some of these, you know, uh, what we call services. Because increasingly, obviously, you can see that people trust their shops where they shop, you know, they trust their retail shop where they shop. So, if that trust level is there, why not, you know, using that as an opportunity to offer them extra services? Another reason why they have to actually come to your shop. So increasingly we have seen that and we have seen you know, the emergence of other you know, alternative, you know, unconventional sources. And even we have seen amongst the financial services themselves crossing up or uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, you know, providing services that hitherto they never did. For example, insurance companies offering banking services is another way of entering a particular sector because an insurance company does what provides insurance but increasingly we've seen insurance companies offering credit facility you know offering credit facility for people to pay off the insurance premiums and as a result pay back the money with interest which is a typical banking services we've seen banks offer an insurance product you know to uh, what they call their customers travel insurance content insurance and all that being provided by the banks so that's another you know new entrant kind of approach by even the providers of financial services amongst themselves. Now, let's come back to contest-based, the Ghanaian contest. Now, we have seen a surge, especially when it comes to fragmenting, uh, the fragmented you know, consumer base, as we discussed in the last session. Increasingly, we have people, you know, uh, small-scale you know, people you know, coming in to, to seek financial services. As a result, there's a growth of what microfinance, savings and loans, and other you know, non-conventional or non-banking financial industry growing up. So in contrast to the global trend, the fragmented consumer base in Ghana has actually you know, facilitated or has actually you know, supported the growth of here. So with this one, we cannot say there's a consolidation in Ghana in terms of the players. In Ghana, it's a contrary to, it's a contrary case to the global phenomenon because we have so many banks, we have so many insurance firms, we have so many savings and loans, so many microfinance, so many what, uh, uh, what they call rural banks and community banks sprinkling up. So it's an entirely different setup when it comes to the Ghanaian situation. It's not consolidation but it's also what fragmentation of the industry as a result of the growth. Clearly, we also discussed in the last session that there was a mergers and acquisition taken on you know, over the last five years or so. We have seen quite a number of acquisitions and quite a number of you know, uh, what we call mergers happening. If that continues, which we expect it to, then of course we'll be inching towards the global you know, kind of character where there's going to be consolidation within the few hands of players you know is it a good thing perhaps one argument could be say yes would is it a bad thing another argument could be say yeah, depending on how you look at it you know obviously from customer perspective from competition and the value for money perspective one would suggest that perhaps consolidation may not be a good idea because these players may have the muscle to kind of uh, what you call adbit customers in terms of negotiations for uh, what is quality. Another person would argue that, well, actually consolidation would be good because they will have the resources in order to offer value for money, uh, what you call product and services. So it depends on how you position the argument, whether fragmentation or consolidation is actually good for us. But for now, we're in fragmented industry players, fragmented consumer base. And then new entrants, of course, we've discussed a lot of, you know, entrance in the last session but what we have seen that the entrance the new entrance in our industry in the Ghanaian industry has largely been African you know businesses as well 
In the past, you would think that the entrant will come from the Western world, where you have businesses, transnational, you know, global businesses entering the African market. But what we have seen is a tremendous entry into the Ghanaian market from Nigeria. Nigerian banks, Nigerian, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, companies, uh, mainly in banks, but of course, telecommunication as well. We've seen the entry of Nigerian players. But then we have seen also entry of Ghanaian, you know, businesses elsewhere, into Kenya, into Nigeria itself, into Uganda and all that, you know, with RLG as a case study. You know, so it is, it is important to note that the new entrants haven't been the traditional new entrant as we know it, of global players or international players coming to the country, but we have also seen the rise of indigenous African banks, African insurance companies, African financial services providers entering into Ghana and from Ghana elsewhere because we have the Ghanaian cases like uh, what we call Unibank and others also going to other African you know, countries to operate, which is a good thing, you know, and that tells you that perhaps the African rising narrative is, is something to be celebrated or is something that is a reality. Now, consumer trust. Well, for, for, for Ghana in terms of contest base, I think that we couldn't actually say that people don't trust because we, we haven't actually seen, I mean, there are research uh, that actually shows that the trust level is, is a little bit, you know, you know, waning. But although we see that, we still see huge patronage, uh, patronage of these services, you know. And there hadn't been any large way of, you know, uh, what do you call, substitute taking over for us to measure the impact of such waning of trust. Because, for example, if we could see giant retail companies offering financial products and we see people trooping there, then, of course, we can talk about the waning of uh, trust, you know, leading people to switch from the mainstream providers into unconventional sources. But our retail, you know, uh, consumer retail, uh, what do you call industry or section in our economy is not as buoyant and has naturally, has the muscle, has naturally got the muscle. To, to delve into or to actually leap into some of these service provisions. So we can say that, yes, there's a shaky you know, trust levels, but we can also say that there's an improvement in the service quality you know, from post-2000 or cycle 2000 when it was only dominated by some few you know, players. So actually, we had actually moved from uh, consolidation to fragmentation and we haven't seen tremendous distrust of the sector yet. You know, perhaps people are still, you know, kind of burdened with the new regime of having access, having quality and things like that. But we haven't actually moved on to a section where we become so deep into our demands. And I think one of these is the reason uh, what we discussed yesterday about the growth of the activism the financial activism sector that has naturally caught on, you know, where people could be educated on their consumer rights. And if that happens, then of course we could actually see the real impact of consumer trust, you know, because then people realize that it is not enough for you to say that you have, provisioned, you have provided your base, you know, but rather people can demand more and they would expect that the banks do more or the financial services do more to satisfy it. So the lack of the activism or the lack of the education perhaps could also be one of the reasons why we haven't seen the massive impact of consumer trust on service providers. So that's the country context of that. So changing financial services industry, we said it you know, in the last session, and we said bank selling and underwriting new product, like we just explained, you know, insurance companies, you know, insurance, investment, transaction, process, and et cetera. So we have banks, you know, offering insurance product, and we have vice versa, insurance companies, you know, offering, you know, banking services. Offshore outsourcing has changed the economics of service delivery for financial services firms. Yes, you know, um, globally we've seen quite a number of um, call centers or what they call a BPOs, you know, business processing, you know, outsourcing, 
you know, happening in places like India, in Philippines, and all those places. As a result, the dynamics of the economics of service provision is tremendously perhaps improved, you know, for the better because these are uh, what uh, uh, cheaper source of labor, you know. And again, with, because of time zones, you know, whereby one end of the world is actually day, the other end of the world is night. Now, these companies are able to provide 24-7 services. And the 24-7 services uh, provision means that you're able to take a large scale of customers and serve them. And that actually scale, the economics of scale, actually reduces the price. You know, reduces price levels for consumers. So we have seen you know, the emergence of outsourcing hugely impacting on the industry. You know, making companies to offer services that hitherto they wouldn't be able to do, and offering price levels hitherto they wouldn't be able to do because of tapping into cheaper labor you know, and others. Industry concentration, yeah, we've talked about a small number of banks controlling the credit card market. We've said that in Ghana, there's a reverse. Although the credit card market, for example, had not actually been a big you know, hit at the moment, we are still much more you know, a debit-based account where people have their own money, they spend their own money. But I think that over time, because we have seen quite a number of banks now in adopting credit cards for a particular segment of customers, perhaps over time, we'll go into the credit economy, who knows, and then, but again, the question is, is it a good, time, a good thing to go into the credit economy? You know, that, that is another debate. Small number of online brokers accounting for large number of online stock trades. Well, again, another part of it that we're lacking in this country, we discussed the capital market last session. And then, of course, we're looking at the online. I mean, the growth of the online industry or the online platform as a backbone to service provision, and especially financial services, is almost non-existent. Even for checking accounts, people are still not using the online platform because of many reasons. One of it, connectivity issues. Of course, when it comes to uh, literacy, I wouldn't want to go there because I think that we have made a appreciable level of progress when it comes to functional literacy. I mean, I don't think that we're still stuck at the 50 to 60 percent that we used to say. I think that the country has moved on into the 80s and perhaps hitting the 90s when it comes to functional literacy. So when it comes to literacy, I think we have made progress, you know, to the extent that people can reasonably use the internet you know, for transactions. However, what we're lacking is the infrastructure, availability of high-speed internet, and the cost of it, you know, cost of owning and having access to internet is still the challenge. As a result, we haven't actually seen you know, a, an offtake of an online platform for service provision. But I think that crucially, the banks is their dream to move people from the in-bank in onto the online because obviously that would make a lot more cost savings for them and it will you know kind of slow down you know the kind of uh, pressures that they have in the banking sector you know that makes people stressed out and all that i think if they're able to achieve that you know that will be a plus but i think also that there hadn't been attempt although they have the desire to move the consumers onto you know the online platforms onto the other platform the self-service platforms you know although they, they they have the ambition they have the, they haven't actually followed up with the actions that could make it happen up till now i don't really understand why the banks are not investing heavily into the online infrastructure or into the in the the the, 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 the e-infrastructure because it will be to their benefit because if you then can actually instigate the consumer market or instigate the market to move online what happens is that every transaction goes through the bank at the moment as the market is this now you could bank or you could actually transact without necessarily going through the bank all right but once the economy is actually moved or the market is actually moved online what becomes the 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 common you know uh, what do you call uh, uh two of the common you know, a, a way of transacting is by using electronic cards, you know, for a transaction or any other payments, you know, online uh, payment method. And obviously, it has to be rooted through a bank. So I think that the banks stand a lot more to gain than any other industry should 
the market go online. And I'm so surprised that they haven't actually seen the wisdom in it to support the infrastructure development that could facilitate this growth. You know, that will be to their own benefit. Then measures made easier due to regulation changes at the turn of the century. Yes, we've seen quite a number of you know, policy changes at the, uh, the BOG, the Bank of Ghana, the Central Bank, coming out with a lot of you know, policy changes, capitalization policies, where the financial institutions were asked to raise their capital base. Otherwise, you couldn't actually operate. It happened in Nigeria. As a result, quite a lot of them moved down, downstream you know, to Ghana to participate in the Ghanaian market. But of course, the BOG also came up with some of the measures in order that you know, can encourage you know, uh, uh, companies to match, not just because they're interested in companies matching, but also key is about protecting the consumer. Do you have the financial backbone that could actually go on to pay off consumers should the uncertainty happen? You know, so that's the thing. And so because of some of these policies, you have a lot of measures and acquisition taken off. It's not a lot in our case, but increasingly we are inching towards some of these you know, uh, uh, in industry, industry activities. The changing consumer, we've said something about that. We've said a lot about it. So consumers are more in debt than ever before. Well, again, the global scenario is that you know, a, lot of peop a lot of people are borrowing because our consumption rate is going higher. We are becoming much more consumerist. You know, consumerist. We are becoming much more fashionable. We're becoming much more ambitious. You know, we want the next gadget the next day is released. <laughs> you know, so because of that, you know, people are always buying. However, we haven't seen uh, a, what you call an an a, an incremental, you know, or a, a, a kind of a drastic change in our earnings. You know, most part of the world people have been earning almost the same as their parents have been earning because of the, you know, the tight, you know, kind of a, a, a economy. But we are demanding more. Because of that, we, we've been, you know, borrowing and borrowing. But again, the situation is a little bit different when it comes to us, our, our contest as in Ghana. You know, because we're not heavily, you know, a kind of credit, you know, based, we can say that the borrowing from that particular perspective is a little bit less than what you have in the developed world. But of course, we can't talk about our government. <laughs> you know, they, they, may, they, may, they may rather you know, fit into that particular frame than the average Ghanaian. You know, the government are always borrowing, borrowing to do programs. So we can say that for average Ghanaian, the scenario as we have in the world is a little bit different. But also, having said that, we can also see that quite a lot of people are also going into acquisition of mortgages. You know, again, that's a type of you know, debt you know, because of the ambition to own. So in our situation, it's much more of capital you know, debt where people go for you know, mortgages, they don't want to own their homes and things like that. And as a result, are able to you know, kind of have a decent pensions, decent life after work. So it's a mixed, but it's not a huge you know, kind of a, a, a scenario in Ghana. Well, population getting older, again, contrary to the world, we are getting younger. You know, Africa is still, you know, seen as the continent that has quite a number of young people. So maybe somebody will argue that because we don't, uh, our age expectancy is not that high, <laughs> you know. So you have people dying off in 50s, 60s, but you have people being young. So again, the dynamics are different in terms of us as compared to the world. Increasing variance in wealth distribution. This one is true for us as well. You know, you look at a gap in the wealth and it's staggering. It's very, very yawning. You know, globally and in our contest as well, you have quite a number of, you know, few people, you know, well, you have few people, you know, controlling the wealth of the nation, whereby you have very broad base of poverty, you know, in our system. Well, we talk about the growing middle class in Africa, but I think, you know, in our due respect, it looks like it is it is even non-existent because, you know, we haven't actually have we we don't actually have the capacity to 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 enjoy the average middle class in the West would do, 
you know. So we still, we have our own middle class, but it is not as exaggerated. You know, I think we have to say middle class with caution, you know, because we're still trapped in the daily, you know, uh, what do you call, needs of, the, of, of our lives instead of, you know, kind of demanding the type of thing that the middle class in the West actually demand, you know. So there's a caution there. Approximately 70% of Ghanaian adults without bank account. That's very worrying. And I think that's also the issue about infrastructure. Because you move from Accra, you get to the other part of the country, and almost banks are non-existent. Why? Because power supply perhaps is an issue. You know, road transportation, I mean, is an issue. Facilities, access to other decent facilities is an issue. So people are not able to move industries or move businesses external to Accra, you know, maybe or to the four, uh, the four or the three big cities, Accra, Kumasi, Takrade, you know, and of course, maybe Sunyani now coming up, you know, Tamale now, yeah, exactly, Tamale now, is, you know, booming. Now, when you go out of these sectors, the rest of them becomes a challenge. So people are not being motivated to move businesses there. And if they're not moving businesses there, what you then get is that people don't see even the reason why they should save or they should own a bank account. Why? Because what is there to bank? <laughs> There's nothing to bank, you know. So the banks also don't find these places lucrative enough to set up, you know. However, what we can see is that there's also an emerging trend of mobile bank owning, you know. These villages or these places that are not having bank access are now having access to mobile money. And with the high penetration of mobile phones into our systems, we've seen quite a tr tremendous growth of mobile money transfers. And these mobile money transfers require that people, not necessarily compulsory, but require that people create an account. So they have their names and their, you know, so once you transfer, immediately it goes. You know, if you don't have your account registered, then of course, you pay something at the receiving end. And because of that, I think it will be interesting for us to know what is the size of the mobile money account that people own, you know. And then we can see, that are they being substitutes to what they call the normal banking, you know, account? Of course, they have limitations as to how much you can transfer through a mobile money, you know, account. And then how much you know you can uh, I mean what 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 else you can do? I know that some of the industry players like uh, what do you call it? Uh, is it uh, Atom? They have come out with an insurance product uh, product as part of the mobile money, which is tremendous. What other product would other players you know come out with? We are yet to know. Which means the service provision with the mobile money and mobile account is a little bit. I mean, it's much more restricted to what it can do. But I foresee a trend where we may change towards that of uh, Kenya, because Kenya has a very booming mobile money account, you know, uh, what do you call it, in a sector. So again, you know, less Ghanaians banking, but there is an emergence of an alternative or of a, of a substitute. In general, larger banks charge customers more for their services than smaller banks do. It makes sense to say, because obviously, the larger banks carry more, uh, what do you call, variable cost carry more cost, you know, plush, you know, uh, premises, facilities, provisioning of internet, access, ATMs, and things. And the cost has to be passed on. The cost have to be passed on to the consumer. Whereas the smaller banks, or even the savings and loans, don't have some of these facilities. And then, of course, access is a little bit restricted because then you've got to maybe go a little bit far to access a particular savings and loans, you know, when you bank with one of them you've got to go a step further to assess a microfinance because the microfinance may not necessarily have a chain, you know, maybe one or two branches, and therefore access is a little bit restricted, unless, of course, within your community. When you move out of the community, you cannot access. And so, of course, it makes sense for them to charge less. The big banks would have a you know, chain you know, dotted around where you can use the services wherever you go, and so you pay for that, for that uh, luxury. So it makes sense, you know, to have that. Right. Sources of change. So we're saying that where have these 
change come from? I mean, what are the things that are actually impacting on the change? I think in the last session, again, we discussed some of them. And again, we, we've talked about regulations. We've talked about the, the central banks in the regulatory frameworks that have actually facilitated the change. The Act in 2004, the 2002 Act, and now the 2008 Act that have actually facilitated you know, uh, most of these changes in the insurance com industry, in the financial sector, and uh, in, the, in the banking sector, non-bank you know, sector, uh, 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 everything else. I mean, so that have tremendously been one of the sources of change, that is policy, you know, government policies, central bank policies have actually you know, facilitated you know, some of these changes. And especially we talked about financial inclusion being an agenda pursued by successive government to make sure that every part of this country have access to financial services. As a result, the emergence of uh, what we call uh, rural banks, community banks, emergence of uh, what we call microfinance sectors and others. And of course, uh, the, the licenses for uh, mobile money. You know, they, these are strategic, intentional, you know, processes or programs or policies to make sure that finance is accessible to almost everybody. So the financial inclusion, you know, agenda. We have the economic forces. Obviously, we can typically talk about the demand and supply, you know, where the demand consumers are actually demanding more. You know, we are becoming much more consumerist and asking for more things. We're becoming much more fashionable. And we are becoming much more global in our perspective. So everybody wants to consume what somewhere else, somebody else in Japan, in the US, and the UK are consuming. So we're becoming much more global in our, consume, uh, in our consumption. And as a result, it's a force that you know, supply has to supply what we are demanding. If there's a demand, why don't you supply? So that's a huge part. But then also we have the supply side where we have increasing entry of substitutes. In the increasing entry of substitutes, we've talked about the mobile money. We've talked about some insurance companies in the providing uh, what we call banking sector and vice versa. So that's also another thing. Then of course we have other you know, financial uh, economic forces that we'll look at. Then declining consumer loyalty. We've talked about the trust issue. You know, again, a huge part because now there are consumers who are exhibiting in a postmodernist character, thinking that if we have to pay or if we have to hook my life to you, you become too big that you wouldn't even take my life into consideration because you think that you have the what the bargaining power. So consumers are no longer interested in sticking with one you know provider. They rather want to sample, you know, they get here, they get there, they get there, thinking that once they spread their wealth that way, one wouldn't have the opportunity to grow too big and to take advantage of them. So increasingly, we see the loyalty levels going down because of many reasons. One of it is you know, the, the postmodernist you know, kind of uh, character that people are actually you know, showing. They don't believe in systems anymore. Consumers don't believe that you know, systems take their, their interest at heart. You know, they, they don't believe that systems and institutions are largely out there for their, for their good. They think they are out there for their own good, and as a result, banks pay themselves huge salaries, huge wages, huge you know, incentives, huge bonuses. Why do I want to hook my life there? So they bank here a little bit, they transfer the money to somewhere else. They insure here a little bit the following week or month, they, they transfer elsewhere. And then, of course, we can talk about the increasing competition, the increasing value that companies are offering as a result, making it harder for people to stay with one firm, you know. If they can have value for money elsewhere, why do they want to stick with you, you know? So there's an increasing competition that's impacting on loyalty. And then of course, we, we, we talked about, you know, the fact that service quality elsewhere is actually diminishing, you know, even in our own land because people, companies, you know, are trying to cut down on cost, you know, laying off works, uh, workers to have very few workers trying to come out with certain policies that can make them you know, cut down on cost, some of them outsourcing even. And we have increasingly seen elsewhere that consumers are getting angry of these outsourced businesses because they think that you outsource, you deny the citizens you know, their right to work, and then you give it to elsewhere right to work. So elsewhere people are actually 
are not happy about it, and as a result, they're you know moving their loyalty from one point to the other, or moving their custom from one point to the other. And then we have technology, of course, a big player. Perhaps one would argue that is a game changer. You know, we see how increasingly companies have moved their businesses online to the extent that some businesses we don't even find them on the high street anymore. I mean, those days we used to see, you know, uh, what do you call records, you know, record companies or record sh stores or shops where you can go there, buy a CD or buy a cassette or buy a DVD. No longer. We don't see them anymore, you know, on the high street. They have gone extinct as a result of technology. The fact that you can download your music on your phone and listen on the go makes no sense, you know, to have a, a record label or a record shop, sorry, a record store on the high street because people are moving online. The fact that you can use your phone as a, a what do you call, a, a, as a little, you know, sound system has dissipated the market for, uh, you know, a Walkman and all those, you know, uh, what do you call, gadgets that we used to know. So technology has redefined the game. You know, increasingly the technology has actually empowered the consumer to the extent that people can mobilize action online against companies, you know, offerings. So company offer a shoddy product and I bet you better satisfy this customer immediately else you find your name on Facebook, on Twitter. And within a twinkle of an eye, you have millions of people talking about you, buff muffing you, organizing themselves in the street, taking drastic actions against your product. The next day your CEO is gone. <laughs> you know, so we see how powerful and ubiquitous technology has become to the extent that even the deepest of villages, the deepest of villages, have an access to Facebook on their phones, Twitter on their phones, YouTube on their phones, and can see anything, anywhere, you know. So the technological factor is a big, you know, game changer. We've seen how technology has also empowered the supply side. In the past, companies or firms with big, deep uh, pockets would want to, would come out with a particular technology patented and they use it for the next 15 years before that technology could be diffused into the market, by which time they have the competitive advantage. In recent times, we have technological, uh, what we call entrepreneurs or uh, what we call freelance engineers, technological engineers, sitting down somewhere, even in our own country, young people, increasingly coming out with innovation that, has been, that have been adopted by businesses. So it is no longer the big players who can actually fund R&D and get a particular innovation or technology and use it for the next 10 years. We have these people, individual people, doing research and development and freely giving it out to businesses to use. You know? So you can see that it is no longer about how deep your R&D pocket is, but how you can actually adapt a particular technology to suit your goods or service provision you know, for customers' benefits. And increasingly, these tools are even in the hands of the consumers as well. So it's an enhancing both the consumer power as well as the small supply businesses' power. It's giving access or giving market access to substitute product to hitherto uh, 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 what you call companies and product that wouldn't have, have access whatsoever to the market because of the competition blocks. So that is how come technology has brought us in terms of giving access, giving empowerment you know, to consumers and to even small, small businesses. The economic forces, as we talked about, we have the interest rate, stock market indicators, unemployment rate, natural level, and leading indicators, example, crude oil, etc. We're saying that this has also impacted hugely you know, on, on, the, on the financial industries and is giving challenges, it presents challenges to marketing financial services. Because obviously the interest rate, especially when it comes to our end here, you know, hadn't been so good because of you know, the fluctuations of our currency against the major, major industry. So it makes it difficult for you to have you know, a fairly good narrative that the consumer will believe in. Because you go to the consumer and the price is this amount, the next day the price changes. So consumers actually can't really budget for a particular product or services that they require because they're actually being pushed or shoved here and there, especially when it comes to the mortgage industry, uh, the mortgage in a sector, for example. The, the increasing 
you know, uh, what do you call the increasing fluctuation of our currency is impacting on the interest that they have to pay on mortgage. And people are complaining because today they pay this, the next day, the next month, the price change. So it's making it very difficult for consumers to buy and for sellers to push, you know, the, the, the product. You know, so that's one of the areas that is actually impacting on the market. And again, we have stock market indicator. We have the inflation, we have GDP, you know, also, you know, linking into the first in the explanation. Unemployment rate, we have what we call the natural level. And the assumption is that, you know, at every point in economic times, you know, an economy would have a, 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 would have to achieve stability, you know, and then would have to have a particular percentage of unemployment, regardless of what we do. I mean, obviously, others have argued that if government really want to accept some level of inflation, they can go beyond the natural uh, unemployment level. But others have argued that that would only be, what, temporal, because there is what we call the natural level of unemployment, where in order for a, company, a country, if a country achieves stability at some point, the unemployment level would also have to be in equilibrium position with stability and unemployment. So that's the, the natural level. And we're saying that if there is that case, of course, with unemployment in our industry or in our you know, uh, country, then of course it's going to impact on how much you know, financial services you can push. Because clearly it's only when people have access you know, uh, uh, to, to work that they can pay off loan. If the person has to actually come for loan and you do credit check on them, the person is not working, obviously the credit check is going to be score zero. And not necessarily score zero, but it's not going to be favorable. If it's not favorable, how do you advance financial product towards the person? Because the person is a high risk. You know, so it makes it difficult to actually sell you know, financial services, to market financial services you know, in terms of that. And then we've, we have a leading indicators like crude oil prices that actually affect almost every you know, economic consumption that we have in this country. So we talked about the regulations. Uh, we see quite a number of them. The Bank of Ghana has overall supervisory and regulatory authority in all matters relating to banking and non-banking financial businesses, mandated to achieve a sound, efficient banking system in the interest of depositors and other customers of these, of these uh, institutions and the economy as a whole. The regulatory and legal framework within which banks, non-bank financial institutions, as well as Forex Bureau operate in Ghana are the following. So we talked about the Bank of Ghana Act 2002, Act 612, Banking Act 2004, Act 673, the Non-Bank Financial Institutions Act 2008, Act 774, Companies Code Act 179-1963, Bank of Ghana Notices, Directives, Circulars and Regulations and then others. So these have hugely impacted on the industry as we have discussed. Depositors funds are safe, you know, uh, to, for example, to consider and propose the reforms of the laws relating to banking businesses. Consequently, the central bank exercises its mandate to ensure that the following happens. Depositors funds are safe, the solvency, good quality assets, adequate liquidity and profitability of banks are maintained adherence to statutory and regulatory requirements is enforced, fair competition among banks, and the maintenance of an efficient payment system. I think the latter one is very crucial. And I think that if we can get to that bottom part of it, maintenance of an efficient payment system, then of course we can, we can, we can live to see the kind of growth that we want to see, because currently, I don't think the payment system that we have is efficient because if people have to be using money, you know, transacting businesses, we're talking about risks, you know, we're talking about cost of, you know, money or cost of transaction, you know, being, obviously the central bank has done a lot to reduce that because the, the rebasing of the, uh, what do you call the currency was a good one, you know, where, you know, the, they, they tried to chop off some of the zeros and then to have a, a very, you know, lighter, you know, currency was a good one. But of course, we still have to do more to reduce the cost of, 
you know, money, and then to reduce, you know, the risks of handling money. So if we can have a, a cashless, so to speak, society, card system, you know, then of course we can say that we are heading towards efficient, you know, uh, maintenance uh, of uh, payment systems. Again, other regulations, uh, Telemarketing Act, this is much more global. Uh, at the moment, I haven't actually seen the Telemarketing Act, you know, coming uh, from our central bank. I think maybe I have to search for that, but I don't think we have that at the moment. Uh, consumers allowed to refuse telemarketing calls by being included on a do not call me list. Now, elsewhere we have that. If you flout that law, you get charged, you know, penalties. So people can opt in and opt out, you know, when they want to be called and others, you can actually do that. But not here. We have Identity Theft Protection Act. Identity theft punishable by specific fines and imprisonment times where when somebody, you know, falsifies uh, the details, use some people's, you know, detail to acquire, to secure loans or insurance, of course, it's an identity te uh, theft and therefore punishable by law. And then you have Fair and Accurate Credit Transaction Act. Consumers can control the amount of credit information that publicly made available about them. Again, I think that these are some of the things that the central bank has to actually take into consideration. And even you know, uh, the, the, the level of debt that people are prepared to take, you know, has to be you know, regulated. And I think that it is incumbent on us to be responsible lenders as bankers, you know, and then of course, responsible you know, consumers, you know, now that we don't take too much debt on. We've talked about the technology, we say use of mobile apps to promote and facilitate financial services, ATM debt cards and uh, cashless society, online trading and online banking. The number of checks written is expected to drop steadily while the number of prepaid debit cards is expected to grow. Of course, here we still have checks in circulation. I think it's also going down as a result of the entry of ATMs and things. But we still have substantial number of you know, uh, check users uh, in this country. Offshore outsourcing of call center operations, yeah, we've talked about that one as well. Declining consumer loyalty, we've discussed that increasing number of choices for consumers in the bank selling insurance, insurance companies conducting banking operations. In our case, we've said that there's also increasing number of choices in Ghana, you know, with the advent of, or with the entry of the new generation of banks and the new generation of insurance companies, etc. And then the, the, what do you call the microfinance savings and loans. And then lower barriers to switching, of course, is true. You know, in the past, because we didn't have so many people, wouldn't switch. They would just stay with one bank. Now, it makes sense to switch because you have so many banks. So if one is not treating you, well, why not? You know. But of course, we can do more to make it easy because elsewhere now, if you want to switch from one bank to the under the bank, all that you do is to give your details to the other that that bank that you want to switch to. They will do the legwork of you know transferring all your standing orders and everything else, your uh, uh, what do you call utility payment details, onto them, and that's it. Here we still have to be going to a bank to register or to put your name down and things like that. So it's still difficult, but I think it's a lot more easier than it used to be. Younger population less loyal towards service providers. Of course, we've discussed that, especially the UP market won't stay with you for long. You know, they will switch from one end to the other, looking for value, looking for better service. You know, lower levels of human contact with financial services providers. Again, the increasing rate of ATM online is actually reducing the contact with person-to-person -person contact, where you go to a, a bank branch and you smile at someone and somebody smile at you and then you chat. That doesn't mean that you can't do that on the, you know, the other services like telephone banking. Yes, you can actually do that, but the facial kind of interaction is no longer there. So even if the person is actually pretending to smile, but is actually <laughs> squeezing the face, you wouldn't know. So that's uh, one, one, one part of the, the challenge. I mean, the challenge is, if we have increasingly you know, depersonalizing the, the transaction process, then of course the issue about relationships suffer, you know, because if we are meeting, I mean, if you go online and all that you do is you, tech, you talk to, you know, Veronica, that, that kind of uh, uh, 
uh, animated <laughs> somebody online then of course the question is where is the relationship do people feel that bond because as we know in relationship marketing quite a number of people go to places because of a particular advisor who's serving them so nice to chat with early morning blues you can just go there and have a nice chat with someone and have a smiling face if all that you get is a, a an avatar on a bank's website you know saying hi you're welcome how can i help you <laughs> you know then of course you actually you know kind of reducing the interpersonal relationship that actually keeps our loyalty to institutions so that's another worry how do we go about that it's a question that we've got to answer as all marketers do all right thank you very much and i think it's been a very good session i hope <laughs> and i think it's about time for you to ask questions thank you okay thank you very much doc uh, my question has to do with the idea of developing a new product a new financial product as opposed to a tangible product for example maybe milo you know that you need this to so and so content so and so amount percentages and the rest but the intangible nature of services as we know make it difficult to do that but specifically with financial services i just want to know how you develop the idea of coming up with any financial product all right, thank you very much for that question. That was a, a deep, deep question. Yes, I mean, uh, like you rightly said, you know, with financial services, due to the intangible nature of it, you know, it is difficult for you to, you know, to say that, yes, you have X units of, you know, product, they look red, black, or green, and they, because of the weight, you know, five kilograms, two kilograms, and therefore they cost X an amount of money. And therefore you invite people to say, you oh, I have an apple. It weighs, you know, two kg, and it's five cities. You know that is difficult to do in financial services. So in financial services, quite a number of things you want to look at. You know, first of all, you want to look at what is the demand out there, and perhaps you might have actually come across that as a result of your observation. You know, do you have so many people, you know, being under the radar in your community? The question is yes. Do you have so many people? having the ambition to start their own business in the community? The question is yes. Do you have so many people having access to the capital that will help them to start up? Maybe the question is yes. Now, after you've established all these tick boxes, what you then want to do is to move a step further to find out from them directly whether truly your, your observation or your hunch is truly the case on the ground. Now, after you've established that and there's a, a, and a significant evidence that people require that, then of course, before you then put up your signboard to say, I have a financial product, come and buy, you would think that because of the nature of it, like we said, people would be expecting to see some kind of evidence, all right? Which means you've got to have your financial product in the exhibiting certain characters. When it comes to the product, is it you know uh, uh, does it meet the needs the direct needs of the people in a way that they could actually you know secure it access it and then pay back you know which means uh, do you have a, a, a convenience you know is the convenience part of it i mean are they able to understand the the rules and regulations of securing the loan or depositing you know what are the terms and things like that you know you've got to have those ones clearly stated no ambiguity because of the nature of it people can't see it so you have to make sure that it is clear enough for people to understand what is the evidence that you know you are a good person because like we said the issue about param and things like that is another factor that actually weighs down on people the risk aspect not only from a supply perspective but from consumer perspective should somebody put their money in your bank what level of risk are they prepared to take and how can you actually defray that risk? How can you actually show that, yes, you have the competence or you have the capability to get back their money and the interest? So there are quite a number of things that you have to show, evidence especially. You know, you have to show what is your capitalization at the central bank. Do you have X amount of money that can actually defray any debt in case of it? You know, just like a, a financial service provider would ask someone for collateral, someone who is coming to push their money into the financial services also would want to see a collateral. You know, do you have the property, do you have the building 
Are you in a building that actually assures someone that indeed this is a financial services provider? So there, is a quite a, there are quite a lot of things that you have to show, physical evidences that you have to show, convenience that you have to offer. You have quite a clear communication that you have to articulate for people to understand. So you need these, and as marketers will say, you change the, the P's to the C's in terms of service provision to make sure that these things are basic and they are well understood by the consumer. That way, you are able to actually birth your financial services. Otherwise, you have to think again. We'll end the session here. You know, and this session, the challenges of marketing financial services, I hope that has gone down well with you and you can actually use the things that we discussed to apply it at your workplaces. Now, next session, we will talk about the consumer behavior in financial services. And I think that will be an interesting discussion as well. Thank you for coming.